we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I have believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. <clears throat> for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. But the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Uh, Brother Ann, would you pray for us? Lord, I thank you so much for this passage, and just knowing that what we experience day to day is as quick as going to fade, whether it's a victory or failure, God, and any misery or challenges we might be feeling, they're all going to be made right and ultimately forgotten uh, as we're in your presence. God, I'm so thankful for uh, our visitors here this morning. We're just having a full house. Uh, the more people that we have in here, the more ears that they're going to hear your word, God. I'm so thankful for a church that preaches and teaches from your word. And uh, just let it uh, instruct us and guide us and correct us in all things, God. So we're so excited for the things that you've worked out. Uh, how Sean's here and Walter's here and just with their work schedule. It all works together for good, God, because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here. Good to see Jalen's mom. I want to see Jennifer. Right? Jennifer. Jennifer. I said it right. Yeah, good. That's my sister's name. I forgot for a second. But good to see you here. Uh, we'll be having our baptism time after the morning service, after the preaching. And um, so after the last song, we're going to have, if we can get this, this curtain down, everybody's got to get changed. Jalen first, and then we'll have the, the girls get changed, and then we'll go from there. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's put the first thing first and just go through the preaching. <clears throat> so after you're done with the curtain, we'll move the pulpit over here. We'll ask the family, if those the families who want to kind of see first and foremost, you can come up surround it by the window here. Um, when we built it, we had an idea that it was going to be more elevated and raised, and it didn't work out that way. This is the last time this setup is going to be used for baptistry. It's going to be a brand new setup the next time we need it. So I'm excited about that. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, <clears throat> there's not really a title for it, so we're just going to go through the Bible, let the Bible speak for itself, in verses 1 through um, one through verse number, um, verse number 6. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And I'm not going to read the whole entire passage, Gabriel did a good job reading that, but I want to point to that first part, it says we have this ministry. As we, have re as we have received mercy, we faint not. It takes mercy sometimes, especially when you're working with people, there's mercy. Mercy that's received for us that we can help other people in ministry, but also mercy to be in ministry. Because a lot of times, people in ministry make a lot of big, make, make the biggest, make, you know, make mistakes. I'm not talking about things like, you know, sex scandals, you know, money laundering. That kind of stuff happens too much in ministry. And those people, they don't deserve as much. They, they have to be punished, and they have to be prosecuted for sins and crimes. But when we stop and think about the ministry that we have, we have to receive ministry. Because oftentimes we go through preaching, and there's times I get done preaching something, and then I have, I'm at peace with it. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to face it. I, I feel like I've focused on it in my life. I feel like I've mastered it in my life. And I preach it, and I go and I present it before, before people. And then Sunday night... <laughs> or then Monday morning, or Tuesday morning, I get tested, and I forget everything that I just preached about that subject, and I'm like the biggest hypocrite that walks the face of the earth. Anyone have that before? It's the most embarrassing thing in the world. 
and it's frustrating. He's like, okay, you learn how to, you know, how to raise children, and you're doing a good job raising your children. And you start praising that your children are turning out right. And then Tuesday or Wednesday, they off the, go off the crazy charts. And you're like, oh, man. And sometimes that mercy is like, hey, you got to give yourself mercy in the ministry that you're working with other people. This morning, I'll use this for an example. This morning, Brother Daniel's up here speaking the Word of God. He's teaching through the Bible. And in the middle of the sermon, he starts, he, he gets this, he almost self, self-abasing comments, and he learned it from me, but self-abasing comments when he's preaching about how I can't do this, I stammer, I stutter, what's wrong with me, I shouldn't be up here. And it's like, look, be merciful to yourself, bro. Seriously, have mercy on yourself. And I'm saying that to each and every one of us, have mercy on yourself. So we went out and go slow one hand, we, boy, we got in the flesh, that we came across that door, that person who was adamant against the gospel. And boy, we got into flesh, and we let him have it. And afterwards, you're like, man, I wish I didn't do that. Why did I waste my time with that person? Or maybe you're at work, and that person comes up, and you're just having that bad moment. And boy, they lay into you, and you lay them back into that, and they go, oh, I thought you are a Christian. And you're like, oh. At that moment, you're just like, man, he's not your testimony, he's got a taint. You know what I mean? Little things like that. You know what? Be merciful. Have mercy. That person comes up to you and they, you know, they come up and they and they call they call the church and that person, you know, they say, Hey, I'm three months behind on my rent. And you're like, How are you three months behind on your rent and your rent? Didn't you just get stimulus checks? Did anyone here not? It was like, how do you how are you behind three months? It's like that money was given to help you pay bills by the government from your taxes to help you pay bills, and you're asking the church to bail you out of power bills six months, eight months in the rear. You know, I'm like, that's, that's, we're just, we just kind of sit back sometimes and we just look at and like, you're missing the purpose of what a church is. And so when we stop and realize our ministry, we have to realize that you have to have that same mercy displayed that was given to us. But notice there's some things that are, there's some things about our ministry. Number one, it's that we're, it has to be fortified. Look what it says in verse number one. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. God doesn't give us mercy so we get off the hook. God doesn't give us mercy so we don't have to put up with people, or we can just kind of say, okay, well, we can get, uh, you know, we can get by with sin we commit, or having a bad moment, or living in the flesh. No, when it says that we faint not, is that we have we have received mercy, we faint not, realizing that even when we fail, God still forgives. Even when we fail, God can still use us. Even when we mess up, God still has a place for us in his, in his service. And we faint not. We don't falter. We don't stumble. We don't give up. We're all, we are all burdened down with the cares of this world. We're all burdened down with strife. We're all burdened down with chaos. Has anybody here, has anybody here had their life not filled with chaos? We're taught at a young age that there's chaos everywhere abounding. Sydney, sit straight. That there's, that there's chaos everywhere in the world. And then we're taught at a young age, we're taught this phrase, we learn how to juggle plates. Ever heard that phrase before? Got to juggle balls or juggle plates? I'm dating myself. Great. All right. What it basically means is here you are, you're, you're, you're in, a, in an aspect, you're juggling kids and schedule. Kids are learning schedule and homework and schoolwork. And they got two plates going. Not that hard. So they add in video games, they add in video games, they add in video games, you know. And now they got five or six things going in their life, going in their life, going in their life. And if they don't get to Farmville on time, or if they don't get to, I don't pet pal, or whatever it is they have, whatever the game is, you have to stay Sim City, whatever it is you guys are playing nowadays, Farmville, what's that? I haven't heard from that since, like, 1960s. But whatever game is that you're playing, people have to, you know, I've got to be on top of this. And now their life is so wrapped up with things that aren't really necessary, necessary in life. But then we get older, and we start making worse choices, right? We got school, we got homework, we got... Um, chores, we've got to maintain family relationships and friends and all this stuff. And then we start adding that in. And then the world grows in social media, ruining lives since 1995, right? Social media just destroying people's lives. Got to keep up with MySpace. Got to keep up with Facebook. Got to keep up with Twitter. Got to keep up, keep up with Snapchat. Got to keep up with whatever it is out there, TikTok, whatever it is out there nowadays. And there's constantly spinning, spinning plates and juggling and responsibilities. When you think about the ministry, we add that much more into it. Now we're expected to be at church. 
Now we're expected to read our Bibles. Now we're expected to pray. Now we're expected to go, you know, visitation and go soul winning. Now we're expected to live for the Lord. Now we're expected to get rid of some things in our life. We got to choose between having the worldly associations that drag us against God or walking with the Lord. Which one do I drop? And far too often, we throw the Lord way up in the air only on Sunday mornings, and we keep on doing this on Saturdays, and we catch it just in time. And bring in, and sometimes we drop God. We gotta wait for someone to come by around, toss God back in the mix, and we start juggling even more. And it's all spinning plates. It's juggling plates, and we're doing our best to maintain all the responsibility we have. Let's be honest. Sometimes we just flat out slip. It happens. And we need to have that ministry. We need to have that 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 um, mercy that God gives us. We need to fortify ourselves that we that we're fortified and that we don't have to faint. We don't have to falter. We don't have to give out. Number two, being found faithful. Being found faithful. We have this ministry. It's not just enough to be faithful in the ministry or to be consistent in the ministry and not quit. I know some people who are in ministry, they need to go ahead and quit. Because they're so deadlock stubborn and doing it their way, never changing, one set thing. They're the ones doing right. Everyone else is wrong. They need to get out of ministry because they're blocked by mindset. They're blocked by what's going on. Now, having said that, God is always right. I'm saying that God is always right. I'm not saying we're changing on principles or doctrines. I'm saying we're changing our approach. I'm not saying we should go to skinny jeans and purple lights and strobe lights and fog machines. That's that's ludicrous. Okay, what we're that's a wrapper. But in this, we're not talking about that kind of stuff. We're talking about just being faithful to what God has given us. All right. So being found faithful. So we need to be found faithful in what he gives us. Now, first of all, look at verse number two. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. When I'm dishonest with someone, there's a, there's one, if you're dishonest, should I say when I'm dishonest with someone? That sounds really bad. When, 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 I, when I choose to lie to someone, okay, and I use myself in this case because I know no one here would ever lie. When I choose to lie to someone, it's not the lie itself that I'm doing. It's the dishonesty the hidden things of dishonesty of the reason why I'm lying to you, right? That's the hidden things of dishonesty, the hidden hurt. It's like we, we take some rat poison and we, and we make the rat poison taste good to rats. And we do it purposely to kill the rat, right? We do it to kill the rat. We got a possum in the, in the garage. We know for sure what we want to do is we want to get some fruit loops. We're going to set, set the trap, put some fruit loops in there. And we want, the, we want to feed the possum Fruit Loops, we're nice people. We're going to feed the possum Fruit Loops. But the end, our, our goal of this is we're going to take that, that possum. It's going to get caught in our trap. We're going to take it, dis, 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 disorient it, send it out five or seven miles away from our house and let it loose. Or we're going to get lead poisoning. Okay? One of the two things is going to happen to a possum when it gets, keeps repeatedly into our garbage. There's the hidden things of deception. But when you start thinking of people in the ministry, it is dealing with people in ministry in this verse. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. There's things that we do, that things that people say, there's things that people have done in ministry, and they do it with dishonesty. They do it with a with a different ulterior, they do it with an ulterior motive. They do it with a different purpose. They're not, they're not telling you to do something because they want what's best for your life. They're doing things to lead you down a path or leading us down a path. Sometimes we lead other people down a path, not even realizing it, but the hidden things of dishonesty. Paul says we have renounced them. We have repented from those things. We have changed from those things. We don't want those things in our life. We've chased them away. We don't want those things. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it tells us how to think. So take our Bible to so Philippians chapter number 4, verse 8. There's things in our life we have to stop. It's something from the inside out. If you've never met someone who's constantly lying, they lie about everything. They know everything. They can tell you everything. They lie about everything. They won't tell you the truth. It comes from an evil heart. It comes from something within them. And they have, you've got to address that with people. You've got to learn to help people identify that. You've got to help the people realize, where is this thought coming from? It's coming from the heart. It's deceitful and desperately wicked. You're not walking with the Lord. You're serving the flesh. And it's showing forth not just how the words you're saying, but the meaning or the intentions of the heart. And the word of God is quick and powerful and is able to discern between the thoughts and intents of the heart, right? Mm -hmm. So the word of God reveals that. And the more we know God's word, the more we can reveal 
It's more revealed of what people's intents are, of why they're doing what they're doing. Okay? So Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Finally, brethren, and you can tell Paul was a Baptist. The reason why, he says in verse number 8, finally, brethren, and then he goes on for another uh, seven, for another 16, 15 verses, all right? He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. God tells us how we need to think. We can't dictate what people think, but we can dict- But God's word does dictate how we should think. There's a difference. And if you feed the flesh, you're going to have wrong thoughts. If, you feel, if you're feeding the spirit, you're walking in the Lord, you'll not have those bad thoughts. So it's thought, it's, it's, it's practicing our, our surroundings, what we're putting into our minds. But he says here, we have to be faithful, and we do it by renouncing the hidden things of dishonesty. Honest people aren't dishonest. That's deep. I'm going to say it again. Honest people aren't dishonest. They're honest. They're, they're, they're not going to go and tell you a lie. Now, they may repeat something without checking it out, and they do things out of, out of character, but honest people aren't dishonest. Just won't. Pure and virtuous, being pure and virtuous is equal, is, is equal to being true and just. And lovely, and a good report. If you're if you're such a loving, lovely person, everybody gets along with you, great. But if you're not truthful, you're just giving people what they want to hear. You're a flatterer. There's a difference. If we're going to tell people what's up, we got to tell people the truth. We need to be true and just, and we need to have that pure and virtuous within us. That pure, that works, that we're untainted and virtuous, and the fact that we're not going to we're going to do those things that are full of virtue and full of purity. And not just things that get us by without without trouble. So we find this also in verse number um, back here in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter four. Not only does it say we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, um, he says not walking in craftiness. A craftiness doesn't sound so bad. My wife does these uh, cool things. She gets this nick. She gets this yarn and wear some kind of another, and she does whatever, and all of a sudden, boom comes out to this lace thing and has people's names written in there in the lace. And you put it against a black mat, or, you know, like a dark matting or whatever, you can see the name. And it's like, oh, it stands out. It's like one of those things you see where if you look at it long enough, it says Jesus. And you sit there looking at it cross-eyed with, you know, one eye, one eye closed and head tilted. You're trying to find Jesus and someone comes along and distracts you to look all over again. It's kind of like that. It's like it has her name spelled in it, which is interesting. But it's not the, that's not the craftiness it's talking about. The craftiness... Is, is doing things deceitful, is doing things deceitfully and honing, our, honing ourselves to do it even more so. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they laid weight to deceit. The Bible says there's going to be some people that are out there, they literally take their craft and they hone it. They, they practice it. They're masters at manipulating. They're masters at getting you to do something. They're masters at getting you to think a certain way. They're masters at getting you to behave in a certain pattern. They're masters at getting you to do something you would not normally do. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, in the perilous times when the things get worse and worse in this present, in this present time, it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. See, the public schools, the public school system, modern public school system education, Columbia University pushes out most of the nonsense that's being taught in our schools today, will tell you that men are beginning, are, are becoming more good. And their idea that the democratic man, that the, 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 not as far as a political stance, but the democratic man that's put together by Vax Populi, that's, it, took, it takes a whole village to raise a child. This one child, these, these children that are the purest forms, these children that are the purest essence of our education, and the purest example, one day we're going to have the perfect utopia where kids are honestly perfect without blemish, and it's going to be ushered in because of the educational system. 
And you're like, that sounds crazy. I'll give you books about it. I'll give you, I've, I've preached past sermons about it. And it's really, really deep. So please don't let me do it again. But it's like they go into this thing. They have this philosophy that at the end of the day, everything said and done is going to mold and make little Johnny, little Susie to be the, the epitome, to be the, the educational messiah. That we have taken and fostered everything that we have and have directed our studies and directed our learning and directed everything we have, even even extracurricular activities, even the parents that we let the parent, the kids go return to because the kids belong to the public school. You say, that doesn't sound right. Well, go out of school for three days without writing a note to the teacher and find out if you have a truant officer after you. Your kids don't belong to you when we put them through the public school system. Having said that, these they're getting worse and worse. God says it's not getting better and better. God says it's getting worse and worse. Then he says this, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. There are even believers who take the word of God and they use the word of God deceitfully. Not only do we have to renounce it from ourselves and realize that those around us are doing it, but the people who actually take the word of God and they'll use it deceitfully. How does that happen? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. There are some people who actually corrupt the word of God. Now, yeah, this happens because some people like to mince and molest the pure word of God. I'm not talking about changing synonyms today, and that's bad enough. I'm talking about people who literally change the definitions of words. And will take the definitions of words and, and, and will change them out to mean something different. And then you have preachers getting up there and preaching these words and preaching these doctrines that are not found in Scripture at all. And because of their stance, because of their reputation, no one stands up to these preachers. No one will hold them accountable. No one will point their finger to the face and say, hey, you're wrong. There's preachers in the past that started preaching false doctrines, and no one will address it because they're called the Prince of Preachers. No one will address it because he was, he was America's evangelist. No one will stand up and preach it because they're afraid of what's, being, of what's to be said or done to these people. But God's word does not rest in our emphasis or example. How much we scream, holler, hiss, and fit, jump pews, throw microphone stands, and how loud we can get doesn't change any more than if we're soft-spoken with a monotone voice but preaching with power. The power of God rests in the power of the message, not the messenger or the delivery. God's wisdom supersedes our wisdom. There's deceitful people that change God's word or meaning of words. There's deceitful people in compromising God's word. There's deceitful people who craft God's word to fit the hobby horses of the day. That's the ministry, and we have to make sure we're faithful and not fainting. We've got to make sure we're faithful, make sure we're fortified. Number two, we've got to make sure that our message is clear and simple. Look what it says here in verse number three. But if our gospel, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is him to them that are lost. It is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So the God of this world is trying to blind the hearts and minds of men. The God of this world is the one who's doing it. Let me make this perfectly clear. The God of this world is a small G, it's not the capital G, it's not God. God does not blind the hearts and minds of men from the gospel. God hardens their heart once they've heard the gospel, once they've heard the message of salvation, and they've rejected it, God will, God will in time, re, you know, uh, reject them fully. But until that time comes, until that time comes, there's, God doesn't blind the hearts and minds of men. God never does. That's Satan's tactic. The simplicity of our message is that of Christ. It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, lived, he proved himself the sinless Son of God, born of a virgin, lived this world, fulfilled the law, in that he lived it, he died for our sins, he shed his blood vicariously for our sins, he bled, he died, the Bible says they took him off the cross, they laid him in the tomb, the Bible says that he suffered for our sins. The Bible says he took our place. The Bible even says that he went to hell. That Jesus went to hell. A good person that goes to hell, the Bible says that none good, no, not one. The Bible says that all have sinned. 
and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ paid that sin debt. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. The payment that God requires is death. If I were to go to Walmart today, and I were to go in, in our Walmart, and the cashier says, hey, the total of your, of your purchase today is $128.64. $128.64. And I went up there, and I pulled out a rabbit's foot, a coupon for, I don't know, Dollar General, and a title to my car. That is not the tender. That is not the way. That is not the... That is not the um, denomination of, of currency that that cashier is going to take. The only thing that cashier is going to be satisfied with is I use my debit card, a check, or cash to pay $128.64. If I walk out of there without paying the $128.64, and I wish them well, and I promise them to live a good life, and I promise them to keep the commandments, and I promise them to get baptized, and I promise them to help old ladies cross the street, and I promise to stop pushing people down the stairs like slinkies, that they're gonna, I'm going to get the police called on me. I'm going to count as a thief and a robber because I have not met the tender required for the purchase. The penalty, the payment for our sin is death. Is the penalty for our sin good works? Nope. Obeying the Ten Commandments? Nope. What is the penalty for our sin? Death. The only thing that God will accept is death. When we were yet in sins, when, when you know when we were yet in our sins, Christ died for the ungodly. When, sorry, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were without strength, there it goes. When for when we were yet without sin, for without Romans five six, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. When we couldn't save ourselves. Jesus died for the righteous. No. Jesus died for the ungodly. Well, I'm not, bad. I'm not that bad of a person. But then Jesus didn't die for you. Congratulations. You're one of the few people that Jesus didn't die for. But the Bible says Jesus gave his ransom for many. Jesus died on the cross for a sinful man. And if you're not sinful, congratulations. Jesus didn't die for you. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God commended, demonstrated, proved his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says that Jesus took our place in hell. The Bible says that Jesus, that he spake, this, he spake, um, seeing this before, spake the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Christ not only did our paid our payment on the cross, but he took our place in hell. He took our place in hell, the Bible says. And then the Bible says that he rose again the third day. Proving that it was satisfied, it was finished, the purchase of our redemption was complete, and the receipt of our purchase is that the record of Jesus Christ, he that hath the Son of God hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you've got Jesus, you have that eternal life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have it. It doesn't matter if you're raised in a Baptist church, it doesn't matter if you've never been to church before, it doesn't matter if you've read your Bible through 100 times, it doesn't matter if you're a good person, bad person, if you got a, if you got a rap sheet, if you don't have a rap sheet, it doesn't matter. It's all based on God's righteousness in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's it. That's the simplicity of our message. But there's some people out there, and sadly they're in churches today, that will get up there behind the pulpit. And boy, they look good. They got this, they got the smile, they have this golden smile going on. They don't, you know, whether they whether it's in a old church, a fundamental church, whether it's in a you know, neo church, whether it's got fog machines or purple walls or, or a guy being up in a row, but it doesn't matter what they look like, what church it comes from, the message is still the same. You have to repent. You have to change your ways. You have to better your life. You have to help old ladies across the street. You got to get baptized. You got to get baptized standing up. You got to get baptized face forward. You got to get baptized by sprinkling. You got to obey the Ten Commandments. You got to be faithful. Give all that you have. Give to the poor. Get to the church. Do penance. Light candles. When, and that's, when you're dead, that's not enough. You've got to have other people pray you in. And regardless of what church you go to, I used to say, oh, boy, anything but that. But I have heard so many Baptist churches get up, there's so many preachers get up behind the pulpit, Baptists, get up and say, you have to repent of all your sins. You've got to stop sinning. You've got to live a better life. I was talking to some um, um, apostolic people this past week. And they were talking, I was talking about, you know, about baptism. So I'm excited about having five people getting baptized today. 
And um, we're supposed to have five. And we're all excited about that. How exciting is it going to be that people are going to get baptized? And they said, well, have they repented of all their sins? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not sure. I haven't checked the inventory list. Do you have one I can print off? You can, like, I can make sure I can do a checklist of it. Well, I mean, just saying, have they, have they changed their ways? I'm like, in order to get baptized? Baptism is the first step of saying, I'm turning my life, I'm giving, I gave my life to Christ. I've trusted Christ as my Savior, right? And I'm trusting Him for salvation, and that's all I'm hoping in for eternal life. It's a testimony of that. And they're like, oh, no, you in this little church out in Sterling, it was the most crazy thing. They're like, no, 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 they got to do this. You got to have a check You got to watch and examine them. I said, well, ma'am, how many times are you supposed to get baptized? She goes, well, what do you mean? I said, how many times have you had to repent of all your sins since you got saved and baptized? She goes, I repent every day. I said, well, can I see your checklist? But it sounds like you're relying on your, on your own self-righteousness. But it doesn't matter what church you go to, everybody out there preaches some twisted version. I'm glad that I don't take it by the craftiness of men, by the cunningness of fables, by the tradition of men. It comes straight from the Word of God. Take your Bibles if you would to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is the simple, the simple gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And I, this, this is what this is another passage. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech was in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We find that in First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter fifteen, the Bible says, <clears throat> Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory which, what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it takes to get saved. Believing Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, and he gives eternal life to whoever believes. That's it. That's all it takes to get to heaven. That's it. Isn't it simple? Man, salvation is simple. But it's so complicated, isn't it? Because we got to put ourselves aside. we got to repent of ourselves. we got to repent of our pride. We have to stop trusting in ourselves and trust in Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, the Bible, first verses 18 through the rest of the chapter, the Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the what? Power of God unto what? Salvation. Jesus paid it all. He didn't pay it some. Number three, I want to go through this about here, about the mission field, quickly about our mission field. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, we look at the mission field. Now, we see our ministry. We see <clears throat> we see our ministry. We see our message. But now here's our mission field. We're not just given something and say, okay, I believe it. Good for me. Good to go. No problem now. Good to go. We have a mission field. We're supposed to go take it to some people. They're not going to come to us. We have to go to them. Now, sometimes they will. Okay? If someone comes up to you and says, hey, can you tell me how to get saved? I'm sorry. I have to go to you. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've seen that though. It's like, no, 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 no. I'll come knock at your door. I'm like, here, I'm right here. I'm like, what are you doing? Use the door. But it's like <laughs> some people's mission field is they, they think that it's that they have to come to church and have the, the church be seeker sensitive, that people who are looking will come to their church and have, have it, everything they're looking for. No, we're, our, our mission is outside of the walls of this church. The church isn't a museum for saints, but it's not a, also not a hospital for sinners. It's a pillar and ground of truth. Our mission field, the Bible says in verse number four, in whom the lost, it says, but, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The, goal, the God of this world is not the God we serve. 
That's Satan. He, that's the God of this world. He blinds the heart and minds of those that believe not. And again, it doesn't say those who repent not. It doesn't say those who live not. It says those that believe not. You know, you can't, a person doesn't go to hell by not obeying the Ten Commandments. A person goes to hell because they didn't get baptized. A person gets, doesn't go to heaven because they don't believe. The only thing that God requires us to repent of is what we believe. God doesn't blind the hearts and minds of those that believe not. The lest, it says, it says this, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Mortal man does not get the impeccability or the, iner or the in inerrancy label. There are some people who are used by Satan, who are being used, who are being used by Satan. They're not saved. They're being used by Satan to blind the hearts and minds of men by preaching a false gospel from the pulpit, by publishing false gospels, by for centuries proclaiming a false gospel. Mortal man does not get the impeccability and errancy label. Men are men falter, men fail, men mess up, men muddy. God's word does get the impeccability and inerrancy label. God's word will not fail. God's word is true. Every word is true. He's a shield and buckler to them that believe and that trust in him. But we have to rescue the lost at any cost. No matter what it takes from us, we have to rescue the lost. We have to not just be out there, you know, calling out for people to come to come to come to the lifeboat. We have to go out there and toss out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline across the dark wave. Right? We need to go out there and get, preach the gospel. We have to go out there at any, any cost necessary to us to give that gospel. There's no bad investment when it comes to the souls of men being saved. There's no bad investment. Well, I gave $300 in missions last year and only saw one purpose person get saved. Is the life of the soul worth $300 to you? It's not an amount of dollars and cents either. What about time? Well, we went out going so many for, I don't know, 15, 15 years. And I only seen five people get saved. Was it wasted? Was your labor in vain? Was your labor in vain in the Lord because you only saw so many people to get saved? When we serve, when we do it for the glory of God and not for rank and number and not for, pop and not for popularity, it changes our perception completely. We should also consider other avenues to further the gospel as we share the gospel. Some of us cannot go door to door if we want to. I understand that. Find another way to go. Find another way to give the gospel. Go in the marketplace. Stand in the marketplace. Wisdom cries, cries in the streets. I'm not saying street preaching. Don't be, you know, if you want to go street preaching, go ahead and go do it. Preach, preach the gospel. Go at work. Bring people to Christ. Andrew brought Peter. Be a witness everywhere we go. Proclaim what Jesus did for you. That'll work. But consider other avenues of what we can do to help other people to get the gospel going at one time. This is what missions is a great thing about missions is we support other missionaries, other preachers, other soul winners doing what we're doing here. Soul winning. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to rescue the lost at any cost. But it's our mission field. There's a lot of people out there who are just lost. There's a lot of people out there who are just misguided. There's a lot of people out there, they're preaching, they're believing a false gospel. Because no one's ever shown them from the Bible. I was talking to someone this past week at, at the at the market, and um, they came by, and I was witnessing briefly to them. They said, "Oh, I've been in the church my whole life." Blah blah. blah. I said, "Okay, great." I said, "Has anyone ever shown you from the Bible how you can know for sure you going to heaven? How you can have your sins settled? How you can know for sure heaven is your home?" No, I'm a good person. I believe the Bible, and all. I said, "Great, awesome." So you believe the Bible. So can I show you from the Bible how you can know for sure you going to heaven? Can I show you from the Bible how you can know for sure your sins are settled? Can I show you that for sure? Well, I'm a good person. I said, great. Awesome. Wonderful. Can I show you from the Bible? I was just a broken record because they're being a broken record to me, so I was a broken record back. And they finally, after, the, after about the fourth or fifth time, his name was John. John Allen. He told his name was John Allen. He's like, you know what? I don't necessarily believe that I have to go, that I have to trust anything or anybody to get to heaven. I'm well secure and set in what I believe. I know what I believe, and that's just how God's going to have to accept me, just as I am. <laughs> I had nothing to say left of that. I could have argued with him more than that, but his heart was closed. He wasn't willing to listen. I could have said something fancy and had a right statement, but you know what? He wasn't. 
He was so full of himself, his mind was blinded by the God of this world that he would not believe. Well, you're narrow-minded. You think you're the only, the only way to heaven. Well, no, that's a thing. I'm not preaching my wisdom. I'm preaching God's wisdom. God said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's kind of exclusive. That's the message we preach every week. That's the message we live by. But that's the message. Don't, but in this ministry, it can be so overbearing, can it? Sometimes we get out and we get discouraged. Man, we're the only ones. We're like Elijah. We're the only ones. But somewhere God has got to, God has got a reserve of people who've never bowed the knee. There's believers out there. And we get to find them every once in a while and encourage with us. But it's our ministry. Don't faint. Fortify yourselves. Be fortified. Let God fortify you. Fortify yourself in that ministry, but be faithful. Don't get crafty. Don't get cunning. Don't don't get deceitful. But that's all I got for tonight. Let's be, let's make sure we focus on our. On, that's all I got for today. I should say. Let's focus on our ministry. Let's go ahead and have a song. We're gonna have our. We're gonna sing a song. We'll have our stuff get ready. People get changed. Get ready to go. And uh, let's take our songbooks and turn to page number.